The ends don't justify the means because you will never meet the end. If you live your life feeling that you are justified in doing unjust things to find an unjust future, you will only create an unjust world. Period. Kyle Kashev is not going to be going to Harvard. Because when he was 16, several years ago, he said very offensive things for which he apologized. I will say this. Harvard is extremely, extremely meticulous in, in how they choose who they choose. And I can't say I'm surprised that they have rescinded the offer of Kyle Kashev. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, over what he said. I just think it's really stupid. Teenagers say dumb things. And, you know, look, if you can't accept someone's apology and allow, allow them to move on, you force them to double down and move in the other direction. This is why I have adamantly defended the right to forgiveness, be it from a BuzzFeed writer or from someone like Joey Salads. You know, we're going to read this. Um, you know, well, let's read it first. I'll save my, my, my anecdote and my life lesson for afterwards, just so you can see what's going on. From the Daily Wire, Harvard rescinds admission to conservative Kyle Kashev over private racist remarks he wrote at 16, despite apology and evidence of growth. It's from Ben Shapiro, who is very clearly outraged. And I thought this would be the, the appropriate uh, way to approach the story because Ben and, you know, Kyle's a huge fan of Ben. And I think it'd be interesting to see uh, Ben's personal uh, opinions on the issue. On Monday, Parkland survivor and outspoken conservative Kyle Kashev announced that Harvard University has withdrawn his admission from the school over a uh, revelation of racist, offensive, idiotic posts written on a private Google document with friends when he was 16 years old. Never mind that Kashev apologized publicly for the comments. Never mind that his public behavior has evinced no racism whatsoever. What's the point of apologizing? That's a dangerous world you're creating if you refuse to accept it. The appropriate response from Harvard, in my opinion, should have been, we want to encourage growth. We want to encourage people to turn away from this kind of behavior. And because of that, we will accept the apology. And we want, you know, he can provide, you know, he, he provided a written statement where he denounced the things he said, blah, blah, blah. And there you go. Make it a profound statement rejecting these ideas. What do you think happens to people when you say, we won't do anything with you, period, if you've ever said anything like this? You are fracturing society. So Kyle tweeted this thread. He said, Harvard rescinded my acceptance. Three months after being admitted to Harvard class of 2023, Harvard has decided to rescind my admission over texts and comments made nearly two years ago, months prior to the shooting. I have some thoughts. Here's what happened. A few weeks ago, I was made aware of egregious and callous comments uh, classmates and I made uh, privately years ago when I was 16 years old, months before the shooting. In an attempt to be as extreme and shocking as possible, I immediately apologized. So apparently he apologized immediately in private before this was public or anything like that. That's, that's my understanding. However, a few, uh, he says, after I issued this apology, speculative articles were written. My peers used the opportunity to attack me and my life was once again reduced to a headline. It sent, sent, uh, it sent me into the, uh, one of the darkest spirals of my life. See, when you apologize, it's an admission of guilt and it'll be used against you. You know what? You know what's going to happen in the future? Deny, deny, deny. And I've, I've talked about this before. The smartest thing you could say, I never wrote that. That wasn't me. This is a smear. This is a smear campaign. Why apologize? Why grow? Just deny it. And that's all that's happening. And I'm the only one. I'm not the only one who's brought this up. He says, after the story broke, former peers and political opponents began contacting Harvard, urging them to rescind me. Harvard then sent this letter stating that they reserve the right to withdraw an offer of admission. They do, actually. They, they withdraw a lot, apparently. He said he responded to the letters with a full explanation, apology, and requested uh, request for documents. I also sent an email to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to seek guidance on how to right this wrong and work with them once I was on campus. Harvard decided to rescind my admission with the following letter. Somewhat ironically, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion sent me this response regarding my apology. Thank you for your email. We appreciate your thoughtful reflections and look forward to connecting with you upon your matriculation in the fall of 2020. How sad that <laughs> they were actually looking to uh, connect with him on the issue. And it was an excellent opportunity to explain why you shouldn't do these things. And this is what I always explain to people. If you want someone to change their behavior, banning them and deplatforming does the opposite. We'll use uh, Carl Benjamin as a good example. He said some, um, some silly words on YouTube in, in a specific context I, won't, I don't care to bring up. But he said, he said naughty words. So Patreon banned him. Now he can just keep using the naughty words all he wants because you've already banned him. But imagine if Patreon said, listen, 
You're bringing in $12,000 a month with us. We do not like you using this language. It's bad for all of us. This is your warning. If at any point from this, from now on, a video emerges from this date forward with you using this kind of language in this way, we will remove you. Guess what would have happened? He would have said, you know what? You're right. I don't need to say these things. It's not worth it. I apologize. And I'm pretty sure Sargon actually said that was the fact, the case. You banned him already. Now you have no leverage whatsoever. But here's the thing. The companies, Harvard, they don't care about what was said. They don't care at all. If it wasn't for the press, this wouldn't even be an issue. It was activists highlighting this issue. It was a tiny group of individuals to make sure Kyle would not get access to Harvard. But then um, I think what's really funny is that here's my understanding. I could be wrong. And I'm not saying this to be disrespectful to um, David Hogg. My understanding is that Hogg didn't qualify for Harvard at all, but got in because he provides some, something else, right? Harvard takes into consideration other aspects of a person's life outside of their, their, their SATs and things like that. So it is believed, for the, my understanding, Hogg got in because he's famous. Uh, Kyle didn't get in because he was famous. He got in because he scored really high. And so they took that away from him. Let's read on, however. Kyle says, after receiving Harvard's letter revoking my acceptance, I responded by asking for the opportunity to have an in-person meeting to make my case face-to-face and work towards any possible path of reconciliation. Harvard responded by declining my meeting request. Harvard deciding that someone can't grow, especially after a life-altering event like the shooting, is deeply concerning. If any institution should understand growth, it's Harvard, which is looked to as the pinnacle of higher education despite its checkered past. Throughout its history, Harvard's faculty has included slave owners, segregationists, bigots, and anti-Semites. If Harvard is suggesting that growth isn't possible and that our past defines our future, then Harvard is an inherently racist institution. But I don't believe that. I believe that institutions and people grow. I've said it repeatedly. In the end, this isn't about me. It's about whether we live in a society in which forgiveness is possible or mistakes brand you as irredeemable, as Harvard has decided for me. So what now? I'm figuring it out. I had given up huge scholarships in order to go to Harvard, and the deadline for accepting other college offers has ended. I'm exploring all options as, uh, as um, at this moment. So then Ben adds, as far as his Harvard qualifications, they weren't based on activism. Kishov was ranked second in his class with a weighted GPA of 5.345 and an unweighted GPA of 3.9. He scored 15.50 on his SATs. But Kishov's activism has been impressive nonetheless. He has worked consistently across the aisle to bring about school safety measures to protect other high schoolers, and that his terrible comments were written before the life-changing event of what happened at Parkland. Kishev's comments were originally surfaced by fellow students who oppose him politically in an overt attempt to damage him. Kishev did the right thing and issued an immediate apology. He did do the right thing. He absolutely did the right thing, and, and he has my respect for that. And now you can see what happens when you do the right thing. Let no good deed go unpunished. They don't care about what is right. They don't care about reconciliation or reflection. They care about weaponizing your guilt against you to destroy you and destroy their political opponents. In a normal world, this would have been enough. Kashav is 18, and he wrote the comments when he was 16. He didn't commit a crime. He didn't espouse his gross publicly. His behavior since has not mimicked any of the content or attitude of the comments. He also underwent a life-changing trauma, the kind of trauma that has provided an unbreakable shield of protection from the media for all other Parkland survivors. Hell, criticizing outspoken uh, activist David Hogg was considered an act of extreme evil by the mainstream media, an act worthy of advertiser boycott. Not for Kashev, however. So um, I'm not going to read through all of the statements, though, because I think you guys get the point and the news. You know, effectively, you know what happened, but I want to read his closing statement and then provide you with uh, a story, a philosophy. Kyle Kashev acted like a dumb kid. Yes, I would actually say a little bit worse than a dumb kid. He was a dumb kid for sure, but it was particularly egregious. He's remorseful, and that I can respect. Denying him the chance to prove it is horrifying. And if the new standard is that anyone whose old comments are resurfaced for fun and games can have their life ruined, no one will survive. I look forward to tasking my reporters with digging up everything everyone on the admissions committee has ever said. If these are the new rules, so be it. Woohoo! Damn! (laughs) But these are apparently the new rules. Kishav is not the first to feel the brunt. He certainly won't be the last. Uh, Daily Mail has substantial resources. Uh, Don't ask me how I know that. But of course, we know they do, right? There's massive reach. One of the top podcasts in the world. They can, wow. It's going to be really, really interesting. But I want to end with a story I've often told on uh, on this channel three or four times. So you can understand my philosophy on forgiveness. I was in Manhattan and I hailed a cab. 
For those that don't know, cab drivers in Manhattan hate driving to Brooklyn because they can't pick up fares in Brooklyn. They have different cars. There's green cabs for the other boroughs and yellow cabs for Manhattan. But they can't reject a fare to any of these other locations. So often what they'll do is you'll flag them down. They'll crack the window a tiny bit and say, where are you going? And as soon as you say Brooklyn, they speed off, which they're not allowed to do, but they'll do it. Well, this guy pulled up and I got in the car and he says, where to? And I gave him my address in Brooklyn and he was livid, furious, started passive aggressively mumbling and swearing, driving like the worst person I've ever driven in a cab with. And I was getting pissed. I'm like, dude, don't get mad at me. This is the city. You know the rules too. I didn't say anything though. He just drove like a dick and he was really mean the whole time grumbling nonstop. Finally makes it to my apartment. And he doesn't say anything. He just looks away and, you know, makes an angry face. And so I go in to swipe my card and I gave him a 100% tip. You may be wondering, why would I give this angry, mean person who is mean to me for no reason, double the, the fare, putting double the money in his pocket? It's very simple. When he saw that amount of money I put in the tip, his face changed. He turned to me and said, Th- thank you so much. Uh, blessings to you. Blessings to your family. And I said, hey, don't worry about it, man. Like, have a good day. And I, I hope this gets you back to, to Manhattan without having to worry about, you know, picking up a fare. And he was like, no, 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 of course, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really simple. The guy was mean to me. He was having a bad day. I don't want him to have a bad day. I want, him, I want him to have a good day. I don't need revenge. I don't need emotional satisfaction. I just need people to be less mean. And so I realized something. There are many people who deserve that big tip because they go out of their way to try and make sure you have a good day. This man was not one of those people. But what would happen if I stiffed him as penalty for being mean? I'll tell you what'll happen. He'd make it back to Manhattan angry. He'd pick up his next fare angry. He would be continually angry, then pissing off his next fare, who would then not give him any money either. The, that person who's riding in that cab would then leave angry, and the wave of anger would persist, with everybody increasingly making each other angry like a virus. The guy who gets in the back of that cab, who's late for a meeting, now has this angry cab driver who's being mean to him, and he gets mad, and then he, he gets out of the cab, and he walks inside, and he's like, what? Then he redirects his anger. He says, why is this guy, you know, I, I, why do I got to deal with this? I'm late for my meeting. This guy's yelling at me. I'll tell you what happens now. I hope. That cab driver is going to have a massive grin, a big old smile, like, wow, what a, what a good day. Wow. You know, I, I basically a free ride. I don't got to worry about going to Manhattan. He's going to pull to the next fare. The guy's going to get in late for his meeting, kind of grumbling. And the driver is going to be like, hey, man, let me take care of you. You know, I understand you're having a bad day. I'll get you where you need to go. Don't you worry about it. Then that fare is going to say, oh, this guy's really nice. You know, that makes me feel better. And hopefully I can spread happiness and love like a virus instead of hate. So, when I, so to redirect back to the story about my philosophy, why create more strife and anger? Why, why do these activists try and do this? Because they want, they want emotional vindication. They want their perceived symbols to, be, to suffer. They want schadenfreude. To me, that's evil. Certainly, there's a, a catharsis in watching your, your political opponents and your enemies you know, fail or suffer, but that's just a cycle of suffering. And that's not a good, good world to live in. The ends will never justify the means. If you think you have a right to smear and defame and target and attack Kyle because you don't like his politics and you will do anything to stop him, the same will come for you. It always will. And the only thing that will happen is we will all live in a crappy world filled with crappy people doing crappy things while they look to the sky and cross their fingers that eventually they'll swim through the air and find their utopia. You won't. This is life. People don't agree with each other all the time. There is no end. The only thing we have is today and what comes from our actions today. So you want to you wanna make an unjust world thinking eventually when you're in power, you can make things better? You won't because you will never have enough. No one does. The same is true for the tech giants and for every tyrant and dictator who has ever existed. I don't want to be absolute. There's probably some good, you know, benevolent dictators at some point in history, sure. But I'll leave it there. Thanks for hanging out. Next video to come up at 4 p.m. YouTube.com slash Timcast. And um, I will see you in the next story.